Thanks for joining me tonight. I was glad to see that the rain stopped just before it was time to set out for the AS. I wasn't so lucky. Uh, but no mishaps along the way. The inspiration for my forthcoming book, which will share the same title as this talk, which you see up on the screen, came innocently enough upon an encounter with a large rock and a stone wall. I was on a hike during my first trip to Martha's Vineyard, following a trail that wound through scrub pine until it ended at a boulder atop a wooded hill. And can I have the first slide? There you have it. This landmark, my tourist literature explained, was called Wisconsin's Rock, and figured prominently in the oral tradition of the island's Wampanoag Indians, a group that I mistakenly assumed, as I soon discovered much to my embarrassment, had disappeared some 300 years ago, along with most of the other natives of the region. A classic New England stone wall, extending from the boulder deep into the forest, added a poetic element to the scene. May I have the next slide? Although it was not until the 19th century that stone walls became common features of the New England landscape, in the popular imagination, they symbolized the pluck piety, and permanence of the region's colonists, and the supposedly inevitable demise of New England's Indians, a subtly sinister but pervasive myth that makes natives who have adapted to their times invisible to the broader public or somehow inauthentically Indian. The story goes that when Puritans sailed to New England and confronted its craggy ground, their legendary Protestant work ethic and godly determination to subdue the wilderness impelled them to plow the earth and transform upturned stones into civilized farm walls. Faced with generations of such stubborn rivals, Indians are said to have reluctantly ceded one tract of land after another, until finally, unwilling to discard their beloved hunting ways for the dominant order, they either put up a futile resistance or else faded into the western woods. The native's destiny by this telling was death or migration. Supposedly, they had no place in a land of stone walls. My naivete soon came to an abrupt end. Since the hilltop juncture of Indian and English symbols piqued my imagination, at first opportunity, I asked an island resident about the place. And I will try a vineyard accent here. <laughs> oh, the wall, he answered. That's the middle line. The middle line, I responded. That's right. It divided whites and Indians in the old days. We built half, he said, referring to the colonists. They, the Indians, built the other. You know, he digressed, we never had an Indian war here on the island. Because this was as much news to me as the middle line, I followed up, well, what happened to the Indians? Clearly, I was from off island. Man leaned forward in his chair, pointed down the road, and said matter-of-factly, most of them live in Gayhead. Adding, by the way, if you're interested in Indians, down the road, follow the signs to Christian Town. May I have the next slide? The Islanders' directions led me to an old, overgrown graveyard of unmarked headstones and a replica of a tiny 17th century meeting house. According to a plaque, these were the places of rest and worship for some historic Indian converts to Christianity. Currently maintaining the site was the Baptist Church of the Wampanoag tribe of Gayhead, or as it is now officially known, Aquina. May I have the next slide? And here you see the Gayhead Baptist Church. Um, this is the oldest um, Protestant Indian congregation in uh, constant operation. Colonial era Indians who built stone walls, worshipped Jesus, and married one another in marked graves. Natives and newcomers who erected boundaries rather than breastworks to address their differences. A New England Indian community that refused to vanish. This was something special. So on the first rainy day, I poked around the town and county archives and the rich local historical society. I found a treasure trove of land deeds, court records, probate records, account books, Wampanoag language petitions, and much 
Historians of Native Americans, particularly during the 17th and early 18th centuries, commonly bemoan their lack of primary source materials. Yet, contained within the unassuming walls of Martha's Vineyard's archives were piles of records that shed light on a supposedly inaccessible population. My later investigations of New England's great archives, and not least of all the American Antiquarian Society, have turned up scores of other materials relating to Vineyard Wampanoags, including missionary tracts, private journals, correspondence, whaling records, and most interestingly, the papers of a Wampanoag minister named Zachariah Huasco. Just on the surface, this island challenged much of what I thought I knew about New England Indian history in particular, and early American history in general. In recent scholarship, historians were challenging long-standing ideas about an unbridgeable gulf between Indian and European cultures by calling attention to moments of economic interdependence, earnest missionary activity, and political cooperation between peoples. For them, colonial America was a place where before or between wars, Indians and Europeans shared space swapping and melding material culture, ritual behaviors, and, far less often, beliefs. However, by my reading, this new literature ran aground the fact that every documented attempt at communion imploded, often in orgies of violence, soon after permanent European settlers replaced missionaries and fur traders as the primary white contacts with Indians. So how then to account for Martha's Vineyard? the place that these historians seem to be looking for, where the two groups managed to live in close proximity for hundreds of years, and indeed to the present day, without slaughtering one another. Another scholarly trend is to see Indian conversion to Christianity, at best as an empty promise, at worst as a sham. This despite the fact that few historians still argue that missions were part of a sinister plot to accelerate the natives' dispossession. Particularly in scholarship on New England, a consensus is formed that when Indians gathered into praying towns or protected in, uh, Christian reserves, uh, the most famous are Natick and Punkapog, with uh, you've probably seen signs from the highway, they were either trying to cloister some of their traditional lands from insatiable Massachusetts. But consensus also holds that this strategy work only temporarily. By 1750, English encroachment had driven most of the natives west into the company, um, into the company of Indians who were moving towards the Mississippi River or into the wandering poor. The general picture is that Indians misplaced their faith in the institutions of Christianity and its proclamation of universal brotherhood. Conversion, it seems, merely postponed Indian dispossession. It could not halt it. Now, the Christian town site on Martha's Vineyard confused the storyline for me. If early Indian converts were drawn to Christianity because they believed, however mistakenly, that it would protect them from the colonial monolith, what was the faith's attraction to Wampanoags on an island far from centers of English population and strength? The empty meeting house appeared to verify that Christianity offered Indians little more than temporary refuge, but the marker identifying the Wampanoag Baptist Church as caretaker suggested that the faith might have something to do with the staying power of the people of Aquino. And uh, can you move on to the next slide, please? Um, just to point out uh, some of the places that are coming up here in the talk here, um, Aquino is this area of Martha's Vineyard, right here on the southwest, Christian Town is located right up here. It's part of the larger Wampanoag community of Tacum or Tacum. Um, other vineyard Indian communities, otherwise known as sachem ships, include Nashawakamba, um, contiguous with modern day Chilmark, Nunapog, uh, contiguous with modern day Bakertown. Um, with a sub community called Sangha Kentucky, located right up there. And of course, all of you know um, the reason we don't need to discuss Chapaquiddick uh, right up here. 
Now, my current research uses two framing questions to explore the problems that I've just mentioned. First, why was bloodshed conspicuously absent from Indian colonial relations on Martha's Vineyard when the island experienced many of the same tensions that exploded into war on the continent? <clears throat> Second, how did certain Indian communities on Martha's Vineyard, such as Chappaquiddick, Christiantown, and especially Aquina, manage to survive as distinct geographical, social, and cultural units into the 19th century and beyond, while others, such as Nunapak, Senga Kentucky, and Nashawakamak, did not? In pursuit of answers to these queries, each of seven chapters focuses on a particular challenge or a series of interrelated challenges that confronted the Indians from their violent contacts with European explorers in the 16th and 17th centuries until they became formally incorporated into the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in 1871, meaning that the natives became full citizens of the state. The chapter topics include why the offshore Wampanoags converted to Christianity in the mid 17th century and how they and their missionaries shaped it into an Indian faith. How some Indian communities deposed their sachems in favor of town meeting government to address the problem of land sales. The deep cultural ramifications of Indian children and young adults growing up as indentured servants in English homes and on whaling ships during the 18th century. And the need to redefine Indian identity and culture when outsiders particularly African Americans, began marrying into Native communities during the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Tonight, though, I would like to present a short version of my chapter on the era of King Philip's War, and then tie that chapter into my study's larger findings. I chose this chapter for tonight because I've been struck recently by the remarkably high level of awareness among Worcesterites Wister about this war and because um, perhaps with the exception of the topic of sex, which those of you who were here last week know, um, there's nothing like violence, or violence just averted, to hold an audience's attention. And not least of all, I think this chapter will give you a sense of what my project contributes to the field of early American history. Up to the eve of King Philip's War, the Indians and colonists of Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, and Cape Cod had enjoyed decades of peace, in part because two Englishmen, Thomas Mayhew Sr. and Richard Bourne, exercised almost unfettered control over the area's missionary work and intercultural diplomacy. In 1641, Mayhew bought English title to the islands, leading to the establishment of colonies on the Vineyard in 1642 and on Nantucket in 1659. Mayhew's purchase and both islands' location outside any other colony's jurisdiction empowered him to rule over the English as an independent magistrate and to direct Indian affairs, at least from the English side of things. Moreover, in 1671, Mayhew's power grew even more formidable. In that year, the English crown annexed the islands to New York Colony, New York Colony, not Massachusetts, whose royal governor, Francis Lovelace, appointed Mayhew governor and chief magistrate of Martha's Vineyard for life, granted him a manor, the only one that I'm aware of established in New England, on the Vineyard Southwest, encompassing Nashawakamuk and, and the Quina, empowered him to preside over a joint legislature and superior court for the Vineyard in Nantucket, and confirmed his ex exclusive oversight of Indian relations. Um, it wasn't until 1691, by the way, that the Vineyard in Nantucket became part of Massachusetts. Evangelical work gave Mayhew even greater influence. Soon after the English first settled on the Vineyard, Mayhew's son, Thomas Jr., began devoting long hours to learning the Wampanoag's language through the help of an outcast Indian named Highcombs. A year later, he entered the missionary field with an unsurpassed knowledge of the native's tongue, and equally important, enough understanding about Wampanoag culture to translate Christian ideas through Indian concepts. To give you an example, the missionary took the Indian's belief in manat, 
a spiritual power that coursed through the world and manifested itself in, in notable people, animals, and landforms. Not to belittle this idea, um, but I, it, it's roughly analogous to the idea of the force in Star Wars. And, and rather than deny man its existence, instead, Mayhew argued that it emanated from a single source, God. Mayhew's careful syncretism of this sort enabled his followers to at once retain a sense of continuity with Wampanoag custom, while practicing Christianity with a devotion that impressed several of New England's most eminent divines, including several of them who are staring at us right now. Yet most Wampanoags never would have lent Mayhew an ear were it not for the eerily fortuitous timing of his mission. In 1643, and again in 1645, island Indians were blasted by old world epidemic diseases, inadvertently introduced to them by the English. These unfamiliar ailments swept off as much as half of the Indian population, often horribly disfiguring victims before taking them away. Meanwhile, the English were unaffected. Now, we know that this pattern stemmed from the English possessing immunities to diseases like smallpox and pneumonia that had festered in Europe cities for millennia, whereas the Indians had not received any previous exposure and thus lacked such immunities. As such, entire Indian communities were struck down at one time without anyone to provide basic care, such as providing food, firewood, and water, care that would have led to much higher survival rates. So it's not just that they lack immunities, it's that there's no one to care for people when they do fall sick. Now, Indians and Englishmen in the 17th century understood epidemics far differently. Possessing only a vague sense of communi um, communicability and no knowledge of viruses, they read community-wide illnesses as a sign that the people had angered the gods, prompting the question of how to make things right again. Thomas Mayhew Jr. had a ready-made answer. He contended that the Christian God used disease to punish the Indians for their failure to worship him and abide by his law. But if the Indians converted, they would enjoy the same degree of health as the English. His logic was compelling, and all the more so because conversion promised political and economic benefits, such as closer trade and military ties to the colonists, and access to English technology, such as literacy and firearms. By 1653, 283 Indian adults, including eight powwows or shamans, had entered the Christian fold. They publicly renounced their gods and formed two meetings in which they received weekly Christian instruction from Mayhew and a handful of native teachers. When Thomas Jr. was lost at sea in 1657, his father and a host of Indian and colonial assistants took over the work, building on a solid foundation to spread the word throughout the vineyard and then to Nantucket. By 1674, all but one of the vineyard's more than 300 native families, and perhaps half of those on Nantucket, counted themselves Christians, and demonstrated a solid command of Congregationalist doctrine. Meanwhile, on, Nan on Cape Cod, a wealthy member of Plymouth Colony's legislature, named Richard Bourne, began preaching to the Indians. By the late 1660s, he said that the Wampanoags of Mashpee and the surrounding area were, quote, generally praying Indians. Um, and just so you can locate uh, Mashpee relative to the vineyard, um, on your second map, uh, you'll find the Indian communities of Cape, Cape Cod prominently featured. Um, Mashpee is located directly across um, from the north shore of, of Martha's Vineyard. Um, right near, those of you who have gone out to the island, it's uh, right near Woods Hole. So in all, um, approximately 3,400 Wampanoags from the Cape and Islands had joined the church by the mid-1670s, 
a number representing half or more of the entire Wampanoag Confederacy. Wisely, the missionaries extended their charges, temporal as well as spiritual gifts. Many avidly defended the natives in their disputes with colonists, and bargained with one especially prodigal sachem to cordon off a portion of Wampanoag territory, soon to be known as Christian Town, as a permanent praying Indian reserve, never to be sold. To show their appreciation, the Indians invited Mayhew to become their pastor, an offer he gently declined, explaining in the third person, as he often did, that in the present capacity, he lieth under greater, greater advantages to stand their friend and do them good. Born, on the other hand, more formally wedded his roles as Indian advocate and missionary. He had long been established as the Mashpee Wampanoag's primary English contact by the time he was ordained their pastor in 1670. He spoke the Wampanoag tongue, represented the Indians before Plymouth officials, arbitrated cross-cultural disputes, and negotiated with sachems and English magistrates to establish Mashpee as a permanent Christian reserve. So here, on the remote southeast margin of New England, learned, politically connected men, such as Bourne and Mayhew, were using missionary work and cross-cultural brokerage to win power and prestige for themselves, while bringing much-needed continuity and trust to Indian affairs. The Indians' confidence in their missionaries and the missionaries' faith in their converts fostered calm in mo moments of heightened cross-cultural suspicion. In 1671, four years before the outbreak of King Philip's War, rumors abounded that the primary Wampanoag sachem, Philip, was gathering his followers against the English. Mainland officials responded by forcing the Wampanoags west of Plymouth, and by the way, you can see uh, Wampanoag territory on the first part of the map. By forcing the Wampanoags west of Plymouth, few of whom were Christians, to turn over their firearms, pay substantial fines, and publicly submit to colony and crown. Mayhew, on the other hand, showed much greater restraint while investigating the rumor on the vineyard. He toured the island, asking natives if they knew anything about this supposed plot. The sachems pleaded ignorance of it, and as evidence, voluntarily pledged their allegiance to King Charles, resolved, quote, to fight against his enemies and the enemies of his subjects, and to advance the worship of God. The praying Indians of Cape Cod reacted similarly to this war scare, publicly disowning Philip in favor of alliance with the colonists, and expressing their hope that Indians and Englishmen, as fellow believers, would, quote, no more be strangers and foreigners. So what was a crisis in colonial relations for pagan Indians became progress for Christians. One of the reasons that colonists trusted praying Indians during the 1671 war scare was that the natives possessed formal mechanisms acceptable to the English of heeding colonial complaints and controlling the disruptive behavior of community members. For several years, Wampanoag con congregations had followed the English practice of reproving church members for their sins and forcing them to confess transgressions that invited the wrath not only of God, but of colonial authorities. Those who refused to confess and, and repent were denied the Lord's Supper, or even excommunicated a sharp rebuke for people in this face-to-face -face society. Additionally, in the midst of the 1671 crisis, Vineyard Indians began to supplement church discipline with civil authority in the same manner that the English did. Each native village held elections for magistrates or justices of the peace to enforce, explicitly enforce, Christian law with appeals passing from the Indians' own courts to colonial justices. Cape Wampanoags launched a similar initiative early in 1675, when war also threatened. From this point forward, at the bully pulpit and the bench, Wampanoags held positions and demanded a standard of behavior recognized by native and newcomer alike. Now, the titles of Wampanoag church and government officers were novel 
but members of the Indians' historically leading families disproportionately filled these offices. Among the Indians' magistrates, at least six of nine were either a sachem, a sachem's relative, or a sachem's counselor. Of 30 Indian church officers, at least 16 were of elite descent, and probably far more. At the same time, these church figures doubled as the Wampanoag's political leaders. Not only were the vineyard sachems Mitark of Aquina, Wapamog of Sanga Kentucket, and Tuwankwetak of Nunapog leading Christians, but in 1675, nine of Mitark's ten counselors held positions such as preacher, deacon, or magistrate. Indian church and political leadership had become all but indistinguishable, meaning that Wampanoags who made decisions affecting war and peace were unlikely enemies of the English. The Indians' reforms more fully integrated them within the colonial political system and weakened their need to defer to Philip. Since the earliest days of English colonization, Cape and Island Wampanoags had paid tribute to the sachem of the Wampanoag community of Poconoke, uh, located in what we now call Bristol, of which Philip was the most recent, recent sachem, in exchange for his protection, arbitration of local disputes, and leadership in diplomatic affairs and war. With justification, Philip referred to offshore natives as his people. But it appears that during the war scare of 1671, the Vineyard Indians, and probably the Cape Indians as well, broke with Poconoke. Just months after the natives submitted to King Charles, English authorities ruled that the Indians could appeal decisions from their own courts to the colonial courts. A shift in the Indians and the Vineyard Indians' allegiance would also help to explain Philip's heightened opposition to missions and English infringements on his jurisdiction in the years immediately preceding King Philip's War. Offshore Wampanoags had turned to a new series of beliefs, rituals, and legal structures to demonstrate their loyalty to Jehovah and their desire for a peaceful future with their English neighbors. They could not continue to follow an unconverted sachem while hoping to stay on this path. The Indians' decision to punish sin within their communities, submit to the king, and join the English court system encouraged peaceful resolution of their differences with colonists. As Christians, both people professed basic understanding about the definition of common crimes, who should judge those crimes, and to a lesser degree, how they should be punished. Furthermore, the Indians had Mayhew and Bourne as allies to help introduce them to English jurisprudence and defend them from colonists who might exploit them during their orientation. Nevertheless, the Indians' compromises exacted substantial costs. The extension of English jurisdiction allowed Plymouth to fine the Indians of Mashpee 14 pounds sterling for the killing of an English-owned horse, to publicly whip the Nantucket Indian to Tannen, quote, for pilfering and stealing sundry things from John Mayo of Eastham, end quote, to order corporal punishment and fines for nine Cape Indians who pilfered liquor from Simon Stevens, and to penalize the Nauset Sachem, Francis, quote, for his uncivil and inhumane words and carriages to Captain Allen, end quote. Appeals of the Indians' court rulings went before panels of English judges and jurymen, thereby giving colonists the power to prop up or undermine native magistrates, and by implication, affect their decision making. During the 1670s and 1680s, Nantucket's English Court of Sessions, um, the only body whose record of Indian appeals survives, repeatedly corrected the native courts by returning confiscated property, reversing grants of divorce, and intervening in contentious Indian marriages. Whereas before, a sachem used violence only after, in, after consulting with community leaders, usually family heads, now, Indian magistrates cracked the whip, the whip by also weighing English demands. On one particularly uh, notable occasion, a Nantucket Indian named Obadiah refused to obey the native justices, charging that they, quote, do not love him and the like. 
in stark contrast to the flatteries, such as declarations of love, Indians often spoke to their rulers using terms like, I love you, that Indians customarily heaped upon their, their leaders. <laughs> Compounding such tension was a lack of cross-cultural fellowship in language, worship, and marriage. In 1674, Mayhew wrote that the number of vineyard Indians able to read and write English was, quote, very few, none to any great purpose, not above three or four, and those do it brokenly. The colonist command of Wabanam was no better, which they used as an excuse not to worship alongside praying Indians. These protests rang hollow, since many Englishmen openly questioned the sincerity of native conversions. Furthermore, Indian-English marriages were conspicuously absent on the Cape and Islands, with only one on record for the 17th century, despite the native custom of using such marriages to strengthen ties between foreign peoples. Thus, the area lacked a substantial Métis, or a mixed Indian-English, population, or at least a legitimate one, that might bridge misunderstandings and provide evidence that Englishmen really pursued the ideal of Christian brotherhood. Indians had several other reasons to resent the colonists, particularly the amount of territory passing into English hands. In 1660, the colonists of Great Harbor, um, now known as Egertown, on the east, east side of Martha's Vineyard, which was the vineyard's main English settlement, voted that Indians who were within the English bounds were, quote, to be removed within this 10 days, and if they refused, to remove them by force. In 1662, Nantucketers threatened to find any Indians remaining on land the English had bought from the Sajones by five shillings per week. But this was not an ins insubstantial sum. On both islands, the natives consistently refused to budge, prompting English grantees to overrun the contested territory with livestock and even to resort to outright violence. The Chappaquiddick Sajone, Pacapanessa, was so troubled by these events that he bypassed his eldest son as heir, out of fear, quote, that he would sell land to the English. Colonial livestock posed other problems. Englishmen refused to fence in their hogs and cattle, even though free-ranging free -ranging animals feasted upon the natives' cornfields and clam banks. Instead, colonists fined Indians who shot the animals and banned traps in Indian territory, or even in areas in which Wampanoag hunting rights were protected by deed. Indians who responded by experimenting in animal husbandry themselves, and there were quite a few, were surprised to meet English opposition, both as a defensive measure in regard to horses, and to minimize competition for the land, Nantucket colonists imposed penalties on those who would sell livestock to Indians, and sometimes even on Indian horse keepers. The settlers' conflicting messages about respect for property and the need for Indians to become civilized on the one hand, and official acts that discouraged Indian animal husbandry on the other smacked of hypocrisy. Thus, in the years leading up to King Philip's War, the offshore natives struggled with English xenophobia, land loss, boundary infringement, and restrictions on traditional and new economic activities, which were among many of the same reasons that the mainland Wampanoags went to war in 1675. The Indians' adoption of colonial institutions and the leadership of Mayhew, Bourne, and Christian Indian officers had kept these issues from exploding into violence. Yet no one could feel fully confident that intercultural disputes were going to ease in the near future. When word arrived that Philip had attacked the towns of Rehoboth and Swansea, offshore Wampanoags had to wrestle with the dilemma of whether joining him and possibly eliminating the settlers was worth the risk of blood. Early signs suggested that the Indians' decision would be made for them. Upon the outbreak of hostilities, vineyard Wampanoags, who had been commuting to Boston, um, in order to, to, uh, to uh, perform wage work with which they bought English clothing, had to return home 
because they said, quote, the English were so jealous and filled with animosity against all Indians without exception. Mainland Wampanoags, who tried to avoid hostilities by seeking refuge in Plymouth, were clapped in chains and transported out of New England, probably to slavery in the West Indies. In the Connecticut Valley, colonists forced the local friend Indians, as they were called, onto the warpath by demanding them to turn over their arms and leave themselves defenseless. The friend Indians' attack on Springfield led colonial authorities to declare, quote, that the plot is general, if not universal, among the Indians, end quote. In Massachusetts, to inter John Eliot's converts on the windswept Deer Island in Boston Harbor. The lesson was clear. Settlers viewed native converts not as allies, but as a mass of warriors who could decidedly tip the advantage to Philip. Even Indians who counted Jesus as their savior and valued the peace recognized that Englishmen might force them into Philip's camp. Offshore colonists did nothing to disabuse the Indians of this notion. Although Cape and Nantucket Wampanoags responded to Philip's strike by reaffirming their subjection to the king and their resolve to defend the English, their colonial neighbors were still, quote, unreasonably exasperated against all Indians, end quote, as Matthew Macon put it. Colonists knew that the offshore Indians' numerical superiority, which Macon put at, quote, 20 to 1, having arms, end quote, would be daunting if war spread down the coast. To stem this danger, the vineyard in Nantucket English outlawed all non-official commercial contact with the mainland outlawed excessive drinking, and any sales of powder and shot to the Indians, and required every English house to keep firearms repaired and accessible. Similarly, on the Cape, quote, though diverse of those Christian Indians manifested themselves ready and willing to engage with the English against their enemies, end quote, authorities ordered the natives, quote, to come no further towards Plymouth than Sandwich, on pain of death, on prison. Making matters worse was that the Indian and English communities on the vineyard were engaged in local political struggles that the war threatened to excite. The Wampanoag's main concern was a challenge to the rule of the Aquinasagem Mitar by his brother, Ampahana, who had just returned from a long sojourn on the mainland, perhaps among Philip's firebrands. Among the colonists, the war gave Mayhew's rivals hope to end his reign and with it, his self-serving Indian advocacy. Simon Athern rallied the opposition by predicting that Mayhew would use the cover of war to unleash the Indians against his political rivals, since, quote, we being about 38 Englishmen on the island able to bear arms, and the Indians a multitude of Mr. Mayhew's tenants. This fear, combined with the surprising outbreak of hostilities in the Connecticut Valley, prompted English islanders to demand Mayhew to confiscate the Indians' weapons. Rather than risk an uncontrollable posse, a reluctant Mayhew appointed a party to, quote, treat the Indians on the west side of Martha's Vineyard, who are mostly to be doubted, and what he means is the community at Equina or Gayhead. Um, and I do think that this was connected to the uh, appearance of all on it, um, suddenly from the mainland. This colonial envoy put the sage of Mittark and his council in a very precarious situation. The order to, to disarm came from Mayhew's rivals, who seldom employed a light touch in Indian affairs. What if Mayhew were unseated or died during the course of hostilities? He was, after all, 83 years old. If Mittark accepted disarmament, his brother might use the issue to claim the sagemship and lead the natives into war. Although the Indians certainly could make a quick end of colonial islanders, the tables would surely turn on the natives when mainland colonists arrived to exact revenge. And there was another issue as well. The Aquinas explained, quote, that the delivering of their arms would expose them to the will of the Indians engaged in the present war, who were not less theirs than the enemies of the English, which I think is a reference to the, uh, my proposed break in 1671 asserting, quote, that they had never given occasion for the distrust intimated, end quote, the natives rejected 
upon his commands. And I'll remind you that this is precisely what led to war in the Connecticut Valley. Yet, the Aquinnah Indians also proposed a way out of the stalemate. First, they drew up a document in the Wampanoag language, quote, that as they had submitted to the crown of England, so they resolved to assist the English on these islands against their enemies, end quote. They promised that if hostile Indians came over from the mainland, they would resist them, and then turn the captives over to English authorities. The way to protect the island the natives submitted was not to disarm Indians, but to arm them and employ them as a guard. The difficult choice now lay with the colonists. To force the weapons issue might very well bring war to the islands, like it had in the Connecticut Valley. But to accept the, the natives' plan was to surrender everything to trust, despite abundant proof that so-called friendly Indians were all too willing to take colonial lives. Furthermore, recently Massachusetts had established a precedent by disarming and incarcerating its own praying Indians. However, unlike Massachusetts, where the colonists' numerical superiority and the rule of comparatively democratic governments made it more difficult for officials to control the mob, on Martha's Vineyard, the power and leadership of Thomas Mayhew Sr. was able to carry the day. Somehow, and we don't have the details, he raised enough support among the English to pass the audacious measure to furnish the praying Indians with, quote, suitable ammunition and coordinate their maneuvers with the English militia. Nantucket colonists railed that, quote, an ill consequence may arrive upon the Indians training in arms on Martin's Vineyard, end quote. But by February 1676, Plymouth, too, began to send the Cape Spring Indians into the field alongside colonial forces. Indian leadership, by figures such as Japheth Hammond of the Vineyard, was equally critical to seeing this peace plan through. Hennett was an ideal cultural broker during these tense times. He possessed knowledge of written and spoken English through his education in the Mayhew Mission School and cross-cultural social standing as a magistrate, a full church member, and the son of a petty sachem. Indians also believed that Hannett's mother became pregnant with him after being blessed by God. She had lost her previous six children. Such high regard won hand an appointment as captain over the newly formed Wampanoag militia with the added responsibility to the English, quote, to observe and report how things went among the Indians. Matthew Mayhew remembered of Hannon, quote, to his faithfulness in the discharge of this trust, the preservation of the peace of our island was very much owing when the people on the main were all in war and blood. Yet this blood consistently threatened to spill over. On the vineyard, Mayhew's political opponents openly protested his arming of the Indians. Then rumors began circulating that New York Governor Edmund Andrews was supporting Philip, prompting a faction of Nantucketers to overthrow the island's standing government, citing its cooperation with Andrews, and to jail the clerk of courts, Peter Folger, even though Folger was the island's only interpreter to the Indians. Wampanoags were nonplussed by these events. They say now there is, no, there is now young men in place, related Fulcher. They do not understand that way and are always in doubt, justice or no. Fulcher's warning that the English rebels courted war was echoed by a Nantucket sachem who told John Gardner that if things continued like this, his people, quote, could not forbear but must fight. Despite teetering on the edge of violence, Indians and Englishmen drew on the harsh lessons from the mainland to find peaceful resolutions to seemingly intractable problems. After the confrontation at Aquinnah, colonists on the Cape and Islands never again attempted to seize the Indians' arms. For their part, the natives followed through on their promise to act in concert with the colonial militia. Cape Indians fought several battles against Philip's men, and their skilled forest warfare proved critical to the sachem's defeat. To discourage any questions about their sincerity, Indian militiamen gathered before their campaigns at the house of the missionary John Cotton, Jr., and insisted that he preach to them. 
They knew that aside from risking their lives in battle, there was no greater proof of their commitment to the English. And I think we can assume that they also wanted God's blessing before putting themselves in arms way. The Vineyard Indians showed their colors when mainland Wampanoags began fleeing to the island, putting the English, quote, in continual fear that the, uh, the other island Indians, by their instigation, may join with them to do as they had done, or to put it more simply, to join the mainland Indians. To the colonists' relief, the Vineyard natives steadfastly turned in the refugees, including, according to Mayhew, several relatives, for a certain fate as servants and slaves, if not death. Unlike Rhode Island's Narragansetts, who the English brutally attacked after the Indians reneged on a pledge to turn over Wampanoags who had escaped into Rhode Island, offshore Indians made the heart-wrenching decision to betray their own blood rather than risk destruction. The deep blow to their honor was the price for their lives. The peaceful history of the Cayman Islands was not lost on English contemporaries. Samuel Sewell marveled at the vineyard's calm despite, quote, these two nations thus struggling together and crowding one another in it. In praise of their accomplishment, he called the island Rebecca, citing Genesis, Genesis chapter 24, verse 60, in which Rebecca leaves her family to marry Isaac, the son of Abraham, thereby joining the people of, the people of Israel, God's chosen ones. So too had the Wampanoags of the vineyard, Nantucket, and Cape Cod seemingly abandoned their past to worship in the way of the Puritans, the self-proclaimed successors of Israel. Moreover, Rebecca's story expressed hope for the future. Rebecca was told, our sister, be the mother of thousands, of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. Now, the Indians and Englishmen of the Cape and Islands had avoided shedding one another's blood, but Sewell was being a bit over-optimistic here. Offshore peace rested on a fractured foundation, the unique power of Mayhew, and to a lesser degree, born. The Indians' willingness to undertake governmental as well as religious reforms that bound them more tightly to the colonists and less so to mainland Malcolm. The wartime refusal of each party to overreact to pernicious rumors, despite harboring many doubts about the other's intentions. The Indians' performance in the English militia. And especially the dread harbored by natives and newcomers about the prospect of warring against one another in localities with an Indian majority, but in a region dominated by Englishmen. Wartime coexistence depended more upon fear and goodwill, and thus, unlike Sewell's vision, the end of mainland hostilities offered little promise of Indians and Englishmen marrying, producing thousands and tens of thousands of children, and creating a single society. In a war soaked with bloody tales about the worst of humanity, that was too much to expect. But in the centuries that followed, some of the vineyard Indians, some of the vineyard Indian communities did survive by drawing on lessons learned during King Philip's War. And here I'd like to touch on some of the larger themes of my study. The most important of these lessons was that Indians could maintain their distinctiveness even while adopting colonial institutions and in ways by targeting such change to the defense of the native community's autonomy, values, and especially land, and by shaping borrowed behaviors according to Indian cultural norms. Yes, the Indians established colonial-style courts that enforced basic English standards of justice, but they did so in part to avoid direct English oversight of their communities and to avoid violence that would dispossess them of the land and one another. In the years that followed, some Wampanoag communities unseated their sachem in favor of English-style town meeting government but they did so to keep the sachems from selling the land without the people's consent. Indians learned how to read and write wills and deeds, not because they began to think of land as an individually owned commodity, but because they needed such skills to use English institutions to protect their communal territory. Some Indians took up animal husbandry, but they did so to lay a claim to land 
that colonists would recognize as legitimate, and they manage their herds communally. Such privilege, or cultural borrowing, required the Indians to give in again and again to colonial pressure to change. But the Indians recognized that their collective identity was grounded in the maintenance of their villages and their communal land base, rather than in a set of static or unchanging customs, and that certain traditions, such as their communal ethic, were beyond the reach of outsiders and could carry the weight of their peoplehood. They also realized that selective change could be a way, as the anthropologist Marjo Salins puts it, to become more like themselves. The Indians' willingness, and indeed their courage, to acculturate or to adopt English ways on an as-need basis without changing wholesale contributed towards the maintenance of the figurative ethnic boundary separating them from whites, even while the behaviors within that boundary sometimes shifted in dramatic ways. And nothing drives home this point, I think, so much as the Indians' conversion to Christianity. The Indians used Christianity to create alliances with powerful Englishmen who would protect their interests in centers of colonial power. When the people lost faith in the sage's rule, they turned to church officials as alternative leaders and used the congregation as a de facto town meeting. Christian schools taught Indians literacy skills that they needed to engage with English bureaucracies and the marketplace. At the same time, Christianity became the repository for Wampanoag traditions, such as communalism, oral history, and language. It was the last place where the Wampanoag language was spoken publicly. Even while the natives were rapidly acculturating in other aspects of their lives. And not least of all, Christianity helped the Wampanoags explain the endless, change, the endless challenges, such as epidemic disease and economic disempowerment that plagued them throughout the colonial era. A second theme is that Indians fared best when and where colonial power was centralized in the hands of individuals whose standing was tied to peaceful cross-cultural relations and who used the Christian mission to achieve that peace. The menu's official power insulated them from democratic pressures to dispossess or otherwise disadvantage the Indians. Their desire for continued independence from the mainland colonies encouraged them to keep the peace. And their constant presence and light touch brought trust and continuity to intercultural affairs. Increasingly, scholars um, such as the AES's John Murren are discovering that centralized rather than democratized power was the best means for protecting minority rights during the early modern era. It's a lesson right for the possibility for the study of Indians, I think, no less than any other group. I hope that students of the colonial era will also see that even as Christian missions were vehicles, and they were, for the expansion of the colonial state and culture, they could simultaneously link Indians and high-ranking Englishmen in reciprocal relationships that gave the Indians a voice in colonial capitals and a safe haven from an encroaching colonial population, while also providing those English leaders with moral and practical incentives to pursue peace and some modicum of justice for the Indians. Uh, to push this point just a little bit further, let me briefly suggest one way to that one way to understand King Philip's War is to think of 17th century New England as a series of what might be called intercultural patron client zones that associated certain tribes with a nearby English power broker. The threat of war was greatest in places that lacked such alliances, and least likely in those in which Christianity was part of the alliance. These zones broke down into three distinct types. In the first type, and uh, you might want to refer to your map here, missionary work and political advocacy linked the two peoples. And such alliances included John Elliott and the Crane Indians of Eastern Massachusetts, John Cotton and the Wampanoag Indians of, of uh, surrounding Plymouth, right about here above the Cape Shoulder, 
Um, Richard Bourne and the Wampanoags of the Cape, and then Mayhew and the Wampanoags of the Island. In the second time, trade and political advocacy with the bond. As in the alliances between Roger Williams and the Narragansetts of Rhode Island, and John Pynchon and the so called River Indians of the Middle Connecticut Valley on your map of the area called Pockentuck. The third type of alliance hinged on Indian land sales and political advocacy, as in the ties between John Mason and the Mohegans of Connecticut and John Winthrop and the Pequots. There were two conspicuous and contiguous areas in southeastern New England lacking such relationships. The territory housing the Wampanoag communities of Mount Hope, Pacasset, and Sakonan, just east of the Rhode Island border, which formed the core area of Philip's influence, and the Nipmuc country, um, extending from the, uh, the easternmost, uh, northernmost corner of Rhode Island, uh, the Rhode Island Massachusetts border, up until the area around Worcester. Uh, where John Elliott had just begun to extend his missionary work, but had yet to firmly enter the Prairie Indian Alliance. Not surprisingly, I think, the war began in the first of those zones, immediately after Philip rejected Rhode Island's offer to have his people's disputes with Plymouth arbitrated, because he did not trust any Englishman to serve as an honest broker. Next, the war spread to Dipmont country, where colonists lacked a local figure who could treat with the Indians, before they joined Philip's cause. Most of these patron client zones remained peaceful, or relatively peaceful, during the war. We've already discussed the Cape and Islands. In eastern Massachusetts, most of the praying Indians stayed committed to the English alliance to the end, despite repeated solicitations from Philip and vigilante violence by the English. Even after Boston forced the praying Indians onto Deer Island, the Indians continued to provide support for the colonial militia when asked. Although weak and demoralized, most of the praying Indians of eastern Massachusetts emerged from the war alive and at peace with the English. Connecticut's Indians responded to news of the war by immediately volunteering troops to fight against Philip's men and providing high-ranking hostages to be held by the English until war's end. Connecticut colonists, for their part, refused to overreact to pervasive rumors of a new conspiracy and never demanded the Indians to turn over their weapons. As Increase Rather put it, quote, they acquitted themselves like men and Christians. It was prudently done of them not to make the Indians who lived amongst them their enemies, and the Lord hath made them to be a wall to them, and also made of them to do great service against the common enemies of the English. Now this is not to say that the conflict did not enter any of the patron client zones, for certainly it did. Uh, turning the Connecticut Valley in Massachusetts and Rhode Island into bloodbaths. Pynchon was unable to dissuade Springfield area colonists from ordering the River Indians to turn over their guns, to which the Indians responded by launching what they considered a preemptive attack against nearby colonial settlements. Roger Williams in Rhode Island was able, unable to restrain Massachusetts from entering his colony, whose jurisdiction they colony only begrudgingly acknowledged, to launch a brutal and supposedly preemptive attack against the Narragansetts. The Vineyard story enables us to better understand these events. Neither Pynchon nor Williams ever launched a mission, and thus their Indian allies lacked the Christian status that could be used to tone down the provocations of their mistrustful English neighbors. Furthermore, neither Pynchon nor Williams exercised the formal authority of a Thomas Mayhew in their respective spheres, and thus they were unable to resist the mob, in Pynchon's case, or dissuade outside powers, in the case of Williams, from violating their autonomy in Indian relations. So to conclude, I hope the story of the Wampanoags of Martha's Vineyard will shape the sense of inevitability looming over the study of colonial America, that the Indian's fate was all but determined from the very start. Exceptions, like the vineyard, show that individual and small group decision-making could and actually did make a difference, that history was made by people, not by invisible forces. The vineyard also illustrates 
that Indians did not disappear from Eastern America. Now to be sure, many died from epidemic disease, warfare, and wailing, while many others left in hope of a better future westward. But as for the rest, they remained by changing in complex and subtle ways, dictated by the challenges of their day. The rise of a few Indian casinos have made the public aware of Indians who have survived along the eastern seaboard through the centuries despite the formidable odds. But many voices question whether Wampanoags, Pequots, Mohicans, or Narragansetts, who do not look or act in ways the dominant culture defines as Indian, are Indian at all. In the end, I hope that those who consider my account of the Vineyard Wampanoags will be able to understand the troubled journey and remarkable ad adaptations, of, or ad adaptations of people who have been defined away for far too long, but whose presence forces us to rethink what it means to be an Indian in America. Thank you.